And joining us now here on the Jay Stevens podcast, it is the host of the DA show on CBS Sports Radio. Can be heard mornings, every morning, Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. until 10 a.m. Eastern time. It is Damon Amanda Laura. Damon, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jay. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Did I say your last name correctly? I've heard it so many times. I hope I got it right the first shot. You nailed it, and not many people can do that. So that is a gold star for you, Jay, early, because it has been butchered many, many times over. <laughs> it is tough um, with the long wording and everything of your name. I do st strive to get names correctly when I'm trying to get, get them pronounced correctly the very first time. Going back, just like you, I've had the interview, the chance to interview Ian Eagle, and so many other broadcasters come from Syracuse. What was it about Syracuse that drew you there to go there for your for four years to really embark upon what is a nice, long, early um, career in broadcasting so far? It was interesting. When I applied to schools, I knew this was what I wanted to do. When I was in high school, I was working for a cable access TV show in my hometown, calling some high school sports events. And I worked in my communications class in, in high school for a couple of years. So I knew this is what I wanted to do. And so I applied to a lot of schools that had communications courses and good recognition for their journalism schools. And Syracuse obviously was among them. And I wanted a place that I could drive to, to see my family. I was always very close to my family and Syracuse was about three hours and 15 minutes away. So I could get back and forth relatively quickly and not have to worry about flights or anything like that. But when I visited SU, to be quite frank, it was cold, it was rainy, there was snow dripping off of the underpass in I-81, and I was just like, ah, I've watched so many 80s college movies growing up, this did not <laughs> look like what I had thought college was going to be. So I toured the facilities, and we walked, obviously, through the journalism school, the Newhouse School, and they had a lot of names up on the walls of guys that had come through there and women that had come through there. And, and that certainly caught my attention. But we went to a place that changed everything for me. And it was the student radio station, WAER. And on the wall at AER was all the student broadcasters that had come through and been really successful. And Ian Eagle was on that wall. Costas was on that wall. And Tarika was on that wall. And Marv was on that wall. And Stockton was on that wall. And Ian was on that wall. And I just remember saying to myself and my mom, who was on the tour at the time, I said, boy, if they did it here and I feel like I really can do this, it gives me a chance to do it if I can do it here. If I can prove myself here, I got no excuse because they did it coming out of here. So I got to roll the dice. And I, I went back to my high school communications teacher and she said, did you make a decision yet? And I said, no. I said, but I think I'm leaning Syracuse. And she said, well, tell me about the other options. And then I told her I'd gotten into the broadcast school. And she said, well, the broadcast school is, is really very competitive. And we've never had a graduate come out of our high school, which is a relatively small high school. I had about 200 kids that I graduated with. She said, we never had one that went to Syracuse for journalism. And so I said, well, that, that makes me feel like I should take advantage of an opportunity that maybe I had not realized the opportunity before. So I did. I took the opportunity and it turned out to be a great decision because the competitive nature at SU was something that I really needed to become the best version of myself. Would you say that competitive nature at the school is that of an athlete where you're really striving to compete, not just with yourself, but also with the other people around you, with this case being the other students that are there in school? No doubt. And it happens for two reasons. When I was in high school, I did a bunch of cable access stuff. I, I did a bunch of stuff for my communications class. As I said, I had felt I had had two internships for minor league, radio, uh, minor league baseball teams on the radio side. So I felt like I had done everything in my power. And I thought I was going to walk into college and be big bleep. And I walked around at SU when I enrolled in my first comm class was comm 107. And I realized quickly everybody had done what I had done. <laughs> everybody was super committed. Everybody was super focused. Everybody had been a PA announcer or a play-by-play -play guy or a, a student journalist writer. And I was like, wow, okay. So number one, you can't feel like you're big anything at that point. Number two, when I started doing work in my classes and at the student radio station, I realized these, these people around me were really talented mm -hmm. and it, it forced me to have to be better. And I thought I was good and I wasn't, I wasn't to the level that I saw around me and I had to get better. 
to get airtime because when you're around, you know, all these other people and they're trying to do the same thing as you are and you're competing for certain roles at student television stations or radio stations and get this play-by-play -play job and move up, you know, within, within campus, you've got to be better. And so it, it forced me to really, really hone in on the, the, the small stuff, the fundamentals of broadcasting and being a better version of myself. And, you know, frankly, I say this a lot, had I not had that intensity around me, which got me down at times, you know, it, it, it threw me for a loop because I was very confident coming out of high school. And then suddenly I was thrown for, wow, maybe I'm not as good as I thought. And maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not as good as these other people are. It forced me to have to be a better version of myself. And, and if I didn't go through that, I'm not sure how my career would have went. I think I still would have become a broadcaster, but I don't know if I would have had the intensity uh, and the focus of doing all the little things to make myself better that it forced me to do at SU. I ventured that you, that competition where you realized I had the realization where I'm not as good as I thought I was. That helped you when you were in school, and I believe you were um, do you were doing work with football, basketball, and lacrosse, and received I believe an award at that time because of that. And I venture that competition helped you really excel at those sports when you're calling those games. It did because again, I'm listening to guys. Now I graduated with two play-by-play -play guys at the network level right now, Andrew Catalan and Carter Blackburn. They were my classmates. Oh, wow. And, and we all called games together. So imagine you're 19, 20, 21 years old, and you've got to be as good as them just to get on the air. And then one of the voices that were older than me one year is Corey Probus, who's one of the play-by-play -play voices of the Minnesota Twins in the Big Ten Network. So these were the competitions that you had to win to get on the air, or at least – be somewhat in their realm to make sure that you got reps as well and that you got on the air. So undoubtedly, when you're doing play-by-play -play with them, because we would call games with tandems, I did the first half, Andrew would do the second half, or Carter would do the first half, I would do the second half. You've got to up your game. You, you have to be at that level. Um, and then the second part was the storytelling part that you had mentioned, I had, had won an award for um, the best sports story of mm. the year. And storytelling was something that I found that I could do. And that was edited and that was pieced together. And I felt like, oh, I, I had an advantage there because my ear was something that could figure out ways to edit things well. And I, I thought that I had a good audio ear and video eye to put things together and maybe that could be my separator but I was always looking for things to separate myself from the pack because I realized that just being talented is not enough because I looked around and I saw a lot of people that were really talented. I'll come back to that editing eye video thing in a minute because I do want to talk about your Nomad, Nomad series on YouTube. But after graduation, I saw and I was doing some research, you did some stuff in Rochester, New York, and um, the DA show wasn't birthed until I think 2002 to 2003. But you did do some play-by-play -play for Wake Forest, I believe. I think it was during the preseason or the tournament. My notes are... Um, my, my handwriting's bad. Let's go ahead and say it. <laughs> my handwriting is bad. We did some play-by-play -play there. You did some radio shortly after. Did you think play-by-play -play was a route after graduation? Was it radio hosting a show like you have now? What route were you thinking upon graduation? Interestingly, I never considered myself a sports talk host when I was growing up because I listened to sports radio and I didn't really like it. I, I, I thought that it was... I didn't think it was very sophisticated. I didn't think it was very smart. I thought it was a lot of people yelling at one another. I thought it was... It just wasn't, it wasn't my, my spirit. And so I thought that play-by-play -play could have been, I did a lot of that in high school and did a lot of that in college. I thought that being maybe a, a host, like a, an update anchor um, or a, a, a game host could pre-game, post-game, things like that could have been um, a path. I thought that perhaps television and doing like a sports center anchor, television sports could be a path. So I kept all my options open because I, I liked them all. I just didn't know where I would fit. And so when I came out of college, I had tapes ready for all of the jobs that I just mentioned, and I sent them all out. And I was just going to say, whoever bit first, I was going to go down that road. And I thought I could do all of them relatively well. But it was interesting. I did have a play-by-play -play tape when I came out of school, and I did send it out for some play-by-play -play jobs. And 
you had mentioned I'd filled in for the Wake Forest Radio Network. One day they had, or one weekend, they had a football game and a preseason basketball game at the same time. And I had known some people through asking for jobs and sending in tapes and resumes after school. And they needed somebody just because they had this one rare occurrence where the games happened on the same day. So I got to call that game and that was a real fun thing. And my first job at a school involved some play-by-play of minor league baseball. But the hook, the drive, the passion of what was going to make me my best self was not play-by-play. And I realized that when I had my fellow classmates around me, that was what they drove for. That is what they envisioned. That is what they wanted. And I didn't feel the same way about that. I felt like I had more of a story to tell on a daily basis, more opinions to share than calling a a game. And that is no disrespect because I know the craft of calling a game and how special that skill set is, but it just wasn't what my greatest skill set was. And so I navigated my way through graduation and trying to get a job and then fell into being a sports talk host because that was not the job description that I that I took but the more that I did it the more that I realized oh this is where my greatest strengths are and this is what fits me most and then suddenly by the time that I was 23 I realized oh sports talk is my drive that's my goal that's my passion and I couldn't imagine not doing it. What were those early days like when you took over your first uh, sports talk radio show? My first job was in Fort Myers, Florida, at a small radio station um, that at the time was an ESPN radio affiliate. And I was only hired to be actually the pregame and postgame host of an arena football team. But to show you just the scale of it, it was the Arena Football League feeder system. It wasn't even the oh, true arena league, okay. which barely exist anymore as its own. It was the AF2, which was a feeder system into the big arena league. And Fort Myers had the Florida Firecats and they had all their games broadcast in this affiliate. And uh, I went down there and they said, well, all we've got is this pregame and postgame host spot for you. But, you know, you could fill in on some other things and we'll see what we can work out. And I just figured, well, I'll take the job and figure out the rest of my week to pay the bills some other way, but I just had to get on the air. I just needed to get on the air because it was almost a year after graduation and I had not gotten a job and I was frustrated. Well, that job quickly developed into me doing updates and producing and running the board and scheduling and all the grunt work that, you know, people in the industry have to do when they're getting started. But they also had me fill in hosting. They had me do a Monday night football show from a bar every Monday Then it started becoming a Tuesday night college football show as well from a sports bar. And then it was, well, when so-and-so is on vacation, you can fill in. And every time I did it, I got a little bit more confident, but I also got a little bit more interested in, oh, how do you grow a show? How do you build a show? How How do you build it to sound the way that I feel like it should sound? And every block of that was really exciting. I haven't gone back and listened to those old shows because I'm sure I'd be mortified at the types of things that I tried to do that I thought was funny, that I thought was interesting or what have you. But it was a remarkable learning experience because I didn't have much oversight. They just trusted me to do what I needed to do. And so I booked all my friends on the shows as analysts or insiders because I didn't have any connections in the industry. But my friends had all graduated and they you know, scattered around the country to do their first level job. So I had a buddy of mine doing uh, television in San Angelo, Texas, and a buddy of mine doing television in Burlington, Vermont, and a buddy of mine doing small TV in Dothan, Alabama. And I made them the Big East correspondent and the SEC correspondent and my Big 12 correspondent and my Cowboys insider, my Red Sox insider. And so it was how I started building a Rolodex and building um, a rhythm to how I did the show. And I took some weird chances at the beginning to see what would work. And I'm really glad that I didn't have much oversight because I don't know if I would have had the, the guts to try things. Like I remember the King Tut, music, uh, King Tut exhibit or something came through the museum in South Florida, Southwest Florida. And I said, well, let's have the curator on. Let's just, let's talk about what the King Tut exhibit looks like or feels like, or why is it here in Southwest Florida? Why is it in Naples, Florida? And I remember booking it and teasing it and people wondering like, what? I'm sure the listeners, why, why are you going to do that on a sports talk show? And I remember doing the interview and after the interview being like, didn't work. 
yeah. wasn't funny, yeah. wasn't interesting enough, but I needed to go through things like that to see what was funny or what was interesting or what was good. And I, I think today, 20 years later, almost, I have a better sense. Some things that I try is still not that funny. Some things that I try is still not that interesting, but at <laughs> least it gave me a foundation of like, oh, this works, this doesn't. If I'm going to do it like this, I need to do it in a different way. There are ways to do everything, but you have to understand the calculus behind it or it can fall flat. And all those early shows were a real training ground for me. I know those early shows were a training ground, and I'm going to skip over a lot because I'd want to get to CBS Sports Radio when you were there at the launch. I believe 2013 was when that radio station was launched, and you went from working different hours. I know you're, you're, you first were there doing one block, and then you got moved to a different block. I don't know the sequence, but I know now you're down doing your morning show now. Those early days when you're trying different odd things to try to build a show – did you try some odd things or different things to start to build the DA show, a part of CBS Sports Radio? No doubt. And, you know, one of the things that I always felt was I, I felt different. I, I've enjoyed being unique in my own personality. I remember when I was very young, I was in second grade or third grade or something. And there was a girl in my class that came up to me. She goes, you're so weird. And I knew that that was a criticism, but I didn't think it was a criticism. I was like, wow, thanks. You know, that made me feel so good because I never wanted to be like everybody else. So even at such an, uh, a tender age to hear that you're weird, I was like, that's a great compliment. Thank you. That's really nice of you to say. And she meant it as like, ew, you're so weird. And I always wanted to be different. I always wanted to sound different. I always felt like I had a different way to spin things. And so wherever the show was, the incarnations in Fort Myers, in Kansas City, in Miami, in Boston, and now at CBS Sports Radio. I never wanted to sound like everybody else. I wanted to set it set apart. And I had to try new things because, look, if you're trying things that everybody else is trying, you don't sound very different. So our first shift I was overnights when they hired me was 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. And I said, how am I going to get noticed if I'm doing overnights? The only way to do it is to try crazy things all the time and to hope that it sticks. And we did. And I didn't mind it. And I, and I wanted to challenge the people that I worked with. And I wanted to challenge the listeners. And I wanted to challenge my bosses for somebody to say, no, that's not good. Because I thought it was good. I thought everything that we tried was, at least the intent was that it was going to be good. Maybe some of it wasn't. But I had to push the envelope to get noticed because I certainly wasn't going to do overnight for the rest of my life. That was not, I said, but if this is where I have to start, this is where I have to start, that's okay. But it's not going to be where I end. And so how am I going to get out of this? I have to keep pushing the rock up the hill. And I have to keep sending up fireworks. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. Look what we're doing. And if you're not going to watch me, I'm going to force you to watch what I'm doing. I like the show. I've always enjoyed it. Um, I actually, I remember 2013 or whenever it was, um, when CBS Sports Radio first came on, I noticed you and I noticed some other voices. Um, I don't know when Jim Rome got to the network, but when he got on, I was like, wow, that's a great way to build the brand of the radio station. But then you started moving around and I, I was working nights at the time. So I personally was like, where's DA at? Like, I, I liked watch, I like listening to your show. But now you're in the mornings and going from working overnights, and I know you worked, I think, um, the 6 to 10 shift and 9 to 12, and now where you're um, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. and now where you are now in the morning, each time slot brings something different, not just to you, the host, on how you can prepare for your show, a game maybe you on versus a game not being on versus a game just getting off, to myself or others that are listeners that our thoughts are different at 7 a.m., versus 3 a.m. in the morning. We may just be getting off work, going to work, on break at work. 7 a.m., most people are getting up. So the style of show is going to be different. How have you transitioned your brain and just the preparation for the show from the different time slots that you've ha been hosting the show? It's a good observation, Jay, because every time slot that I've done, I've had to approach it at least slightly differently. The overnight show was of course reaction to what happened in the night of sports, but also it had to be zany. It had to be loopy it because that's what people up at that time of the night are thinking, are living, are doing. And so the listeners as callers, as characters were a huge part of the show because 
I want you to embrace all the zaniness. If you are up in the middle of the night listening to us, why? What? Yeah. What are you doing? What's going on in your life? You have to be pretty interesting. You have to be living a pretty interesting life. So what is that? And so we tapped into that. And then we did evenings, six until 10 Eastern time. And so you're reacting in real time to what the games are. You're kind of setting up the night and then reacting to the games. Because if you have a take that happened earlier in the day, it's been said a million times over, you know? So you have to have something unique in how you're prepping for the games or you're reacting to what happened the day before. And then we did mid mornings, nine until noon. And it was more of a table setter of the day. You know, it's the time slot where there's a lot of heavy hitters, the Cowherds of the world, the Levitards of the world, the Dan Patricks. They're all, you know, kind of doing what you would assume is reacting to the night before and kind of, you know, long form explaining things. And I like that. But the morning show is a really good fit for my personality because I like reacting to the games and I like expounding on thoughts and being the first to talk about them. But I also like the quick pace and the fun that is demanded in mornings. People don't want to be angered in the mornings. They don't want to be annoyed. They don't want to be bored. They want to have fun. They want to have fun. They want to have fun. They want, if their day is going to suck, they want at least it to start off with a smile. So I think our show does that pretty well. And I, and I like the combination of tackling stuff from the night before, but also having the breath and having the leniency to, yeah, you're allowed to try new things. You're allowed to be funny. You're allowed to riff. You're allowed to do bits because it's morning radio. And that fits me. Couple more questions for you. This has been a lot of fun. Time's going by very, very fast. How did COVID affect your show? Well, the number one way was that it, it split apart our chemistry at the outset because we couldn't all be together. And for a show that's an ensemble show, and I really like having multiple voices part of my show, it, it always is necessary to have everybody connecting with one another and reacting to one another in real time. And when you're forced to be at your home studio and everybody is at a separate place, you, you don't have that rhythm. So I think at the outset, we had to work through it. We tinkered with things a little bit to make sure that we had it. And I think by now, more than a year later, I think if you listen to the show, it's virtually impossible to know that we're not all in the same place together because we have that, we've got that pitter patter down. We've got that rhythm down. The other thing was just, what do you talk about for four yeah. hours every single day? And I found myself having to be even more creative than ever before. And to be honest, there was always a part of me that said, if there were no sports to talk about, what would I talk about? And I actually got my wish. And so we created all types of topics of this date in mothership history where we took that day from the previous seven years and found something funny that happened and then riffed off that. Or we did uh, sports movies every single week. We watched a sports movie and then broke it down like it was a game that we were watching, the actual tangible sports in it not whether it was a good movie or not but the sports in it so that was very fun we did my favorite sports team ever and so a week of our childhood team and getting a player on from that team and talking to that player or that coach we did forgotten classics it was great games that people had forgotten about and went inside the minutia of that game and and went with a guest or a broadcaster that had called that game or a player that had played in that game so we did a lot of unique things and I loved it. In fact, we did a bunch of fishermen, a bunch of bass wow. fishermen from the bass fishing tour because that was one of the things that did not get shut down because they could be on their own boat. Oh, in the yeah. of the lake. So we talked fishing. Uh, and so I liked it. I got to admit that I'll always be, I'll always be romantic about those shows because it took a lot to get them off the ground but it forced us to be as creative as we could possibly be. Interesting to use that word creative. When I mentioned earlier that I was going to come back to your editing eye, the video and the sound and all that stuff from early on in your, your career. Well, you have this series on YouTube, Nomad, and creativity is something that I, when I was watching the videos, you see creativity everywhere, just being able to edit it, what to look for, the angles to look at. Um, I was watching the one, I think it was at Fenway Park, I believe. Um, and I'm just like, this is amazing. A different view, someone that's in the broadcasting industry, but also a first for them and just seeing how they perceive different parks and different things around the world. What created that thought in your mind to 
create the show? It's a TV show I always wanted to host. I love Anthony Bourdain. I love those travel shows. I like travel shows that end up, I like to explore and I like to travel, but I also like to, I like to tap into something that's local about the culture or to really experience it. And sports is a great way to do so. So I said, this is the show that I've always wanted to host instead of waiting for a network to give me the platform or the resources, since I'm going around the country anyway to, to do my show and to travel to go see games, let me film it and edit it because I'm doing this anyway. And I've always enjoyed editing and I've always enjoyed video work. And today in 2021, you know, because of YouTube and because of iMovie on your laptop and because of Photoshop and all this type of stuff, you, you're your own director, your own producer. Everybody can do this on the, their own. So I, I said, let me jump into this. And it was really rewarding and it still is. I don't put them out as regularly as I used to. I used to put them out almost every week, which was quite the grind because that's a lot of hours that it took to shoot and to edit and to storyboard, et cetera. But it's a part of me that you probably don't hear on the radio. It also lasts forever. Radio shows are in and out. Nobody's gonna go back and listen to my full show from three years ago. So this is something that is going to last forever that I like the, the permanence of it. And I also just think visually, there's things that I can tell from a story standpoint that I can't tell on the radio. Audio is beautiful and audio can be used in beautiful ways, but there is something about going to Clemson and having a shot of this orange and purple stadium with a sunset behind it in a rolling grass hill that I can't, I can't get to that visual on radio. So to tell it in video form, visual form, is something that I wanted to do. So it was something a way just to complement the things that I do every day on radio and to hope that one day somebody sees it and goes, you know what, this is a really good idea. We should do more of these and DA will fund it. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see if that happens, but I, it's been very, very rewarding to do. It seems like it has. Do you have any last words or comments you want to leave listeners with or viewers maybe watching this on YouTube, maybe something you've picked up along your way early on in college or picked up early on in the, in the in your career, maybe something that happened before we started recording. I don't know. Any last words about anything to leave us with on this episode of the podcast? Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, then definitely you can click over to see my Nomad videos because I think... You know, they're mostly six, seven minutes long. Some are a little bit longer, 10 or 11 minutes. But I think it's a it's a pretty cool story in how sports affects culture and affects the city and place around it and the fans and everything. So you can just search Nomad in my name, Damon, D-A-M-O-N, which is Nomad Backwards on YouTube. And you, you'll find the whole page of them. There's about 80 episodes now. And the other thing in terms of my career that I, I try to you know, stress when I talk to people that are interested in the career and my path is that I didn't know exactly where I was going to end up, but I knew that I had to be focused and hardworking and driven to get there. And so I started with those as my foundations. And the focus was, I'm going to do something in sports broadcasting. So let me just keep one foot in front of the other. How do I do this every single day? How do I get better every single day? How am I driven every single day to do it? And then when the door opens, be ready for the door to open. Had I said when I was 15, I want to be a, a sports radio host and I'm not going to do anything else, I wouldn't have the complement of skills that I got from going to Syracuse and trying to be a play-by-play -play guy and trying to do updates. And when my first job was, you've got to run the board now and you've got to you know, schedule and understand how breaks work and commercial breaks. All of that stuff is so vital to me now because I, there's a skill set that I use with all of that that I use in building a show and timing and audio and the audio that will play and how does this sound and how will this read on the radio, et cetera. So I think if, you're, if you have a dream, you have to keep working towards the dream one foot in front of the other, but you also have to be flexible and know that every step helps you get there as long as you keep an open mind and keep moving forward. And I think maybe some people get really frustrated because the exact dream that they have isn't what becomes. And so you get thrown off course, but instead use it and realize that it's just, it's a different door that opened, but it might be in the same house. And I think that's what ended up happening to me. I, I always knew the house I wanted to be in, but I didn't know what room I was gonna be in. And then the room opened up and I didn't think that was my room. And then I realized, wow, no, this is my room and I never wanna leave. 
Damon, this has been fun. A lot of fun. I uh, got to really go through it very quickly. Time literally flew by. I had no idea it was moving, it was moving like it was. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast and really just telling your story in your own way uh, about what happened in your career and really just how everything that started helped shape you in the, in the host you are today. Thanks so much, Damon, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Jay, my pleasure. This was a lot of fun, man. Thank you.